Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon or almost afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today for our fourth session all about manatees. Uh, while we wait for folks to join, please introduce yourself in the chat. We know uh, quite a few of you are returning from previous sessions, but if you're new or if you'd just like to introduce yourself again, please go ahead and select panelists and attendees and in introduce yourself in session four. Welcome, Mater Prep. ASD Cluster, Crescent, Crescent Park, welcome. Sunset Park Elementary, Christina M. Eve, Miami Dade Senior High, welcome. Bartow Elementary in Polk County, welcome. Some more in Gainesville, Orange County, Palm Beach County, Coral Reef. Oh, welcome, uh, Susan, your three grandsons that want to learn about manatees. That's fantastic. Thank you for joining. Academy East. Uh, lots of folks from Palm Beach County, so you may be familiar with Manatee Lagoon. Wonderful. Morningside, Miami-Dade, Citrus Cove Elementary, more Palm Beach. That's fantastic. We love the local connection here. Mary Beth, welcome again. Tracy, lots of folks in Orange County. We love to see it. Some folks in Martin County, welcome. Excellent, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So we end on time, uh, but welcome to session four, all about manatees with Manatee Lagoon. So thank you so much for joining. We are excited to learn all about manatees with Manatee Lagoon, which is a Florida Power and Light Eco Discovery Center. So in this session, you'll discover the wonderful world of manatees and learn all about the engaging educational resources from Manatee Lagoon, um, as well as just get to uh, know and learn about manatees, which uh, are a part of the Everglades ecosystem. So manatees actually live right here in Florida, as well as in parts of the Everglades. Uh, so just some housekeeping rules like all of our other sessions. If you do have questions or feedback throughout the presentation, please share them in the chat. We have many members of the education team as well as myself and Wendy are monitoring the chats. So we'll be able to answer those questions and please select all panelists and attendees so we can all see your questions and feedback. And again, we will make sure to make time uh, throughout the presentation for questions. Also, this presentation will have polls. We have some trivia questions about manatees. Uh, so we'll be utilizing those throughout the presentation. Again, if you are excited about the teacher symposium, please connect with us on social media to share your excitement. So we have our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter handles, as well as if you do take any pictures, share any resources, even in the months or weeks to come, uh, please use hashtags, hashtag Everglades Literacy, hashtag get your feet wet, and hashtag take the first step. Excellent. So uh, if you've been following along, uh, my name is Kim Gooch. I am the Everglades Literacy Program Coordinator located in Orlando, Florida, uh, helping a lot with our Central Florida, West Central, East Central County schools. Um, but uh, we are joined today by Wendy. She is the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Manatee Lagoon uh, in Palm Beach County. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we know we have a lot of teachers who are very excited about this presentation. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kimberly. This was a wonderful introduction. And I am very excited about the Everglades Teacher Symposium too. What a great resource and hope you're all enjoying all the programs. So today, as Kim mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you all about manatees. So I'll give you a little overview of, of them as well as a few other details. So we'll get started. So as I mentioned, we'll talk to you, um, We'll start off a little bit with who we are, as well as talk all about manatees. I'll take you on a brief virtual field trip to our center, review some educational resources that are available, 
as well as talk to you about how we can all help manatees. So starting right off with who we are, Manatee Lagoon is, as Kim said, is an FPL Eco Discovery Center, and it's a free educational attraction with a dedicated area for viewing manatees up close. So as part of a requirement to provide access for the public for manatee viewing at the site of the Florida Power and Light Riviera Beach Next Generation Clean Energy Center, which is the power plant next to us, FPL designed, constructed, and opened Manatee Lagoon. So we just celebrated our fifth anniversary earlier this year. So we're located on the waterfront of the Lake Worth Lagoon, which is, uh, we're also on the line between Riviera Beach and West Palm Beach. And so we're in Palm Beach County. Uh, we are obviously a part of the greater Everglades ecosystem too. So our site features these beautiful views, uh, exhibits on all things manatees, so you can learn more about the species. And we have activities throughout the year for all ages. At this time, Manatee Lagoon is still currently closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we transitioned into virtual programming and we're continuing to do that and we'll continue to do so even once we're able to safely reopen our doors. So we are located about one mile south of the Port of Palm Beach. And as you can see in this image, we're also close to Peanut Island, the Blue Heron Bridge and the Lake Worth Inlet. So during the winter months, Manatee Lagoon is one of the few places in the world where you can observe wild manatees in their natural habitat. And as mentioned, Manatee Lagoon is right next to the FPL Clean Energy Center. And that's what the, that location releases clean, warm water into an outflow area, which in the image on the left, you can see where our little mascot, Mia the Manatee is located, that kind of rectangular location. That's the outflow area. So that's where primarily the warmer water is being released. And so many manatees are drawn to that location, that warm water next to our center year after year. And manatee season in Florida is the time frame between November 15th and March 31st. So this is the time of year when the temperatures are dropping or it's cooler. So manatees, even though they may spread out even beyond the state of Florida, are coming back into Florida waters, they're migrating, they're on the move. And so other protections go into place during this time frame to protect these animals, such as speed zones. So on some of the chilliest winter days, you might be able to see hundreds of manatees gathered in this area, uh, staying warm in the water surrounding our center. So our mission, which is to educate the public about manatees in Lake Worth Lagoon, and inspiring communities to preserve and protect Florida's environment and wildlife for future generations guides everything we do at the center. And so we have this amazing waterfront setting, beautiful site for learning and teaching. And while it may be more likely that we would spot a manatee during the colder parts of the year, there's always something to see at our center. So here's our first trivia question. And if you've been paying attention, it won't be too hard. <laughs> So there's a poll that has popped up. So I encourage you to take the poll. So there's definitely four questions, options. And I can see your responses right now on my other screen. That's why I'm turning my head. <laughs> we'll give just another moment to respond, finish responding. And Kim, do I need to uh, select the end polling or are you good with the timeout? You tell me. I'll make sure to end when everyone votes. Okay. Looks like we've got most or maybe three quarters of the way of voting. You can finish up and put your entries in. And we see. Some great responses. Love it. Yeah, some good responses. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. All right. So you should be seeing the results or I'm seeing the results <laughs> and you have these options. And it looks like the majority of you, about three quarters selected the correct option, which was November 15th through March 31st. And while certainly most of the other dates span the, some of the colder times of the year, uh, the time frame of November 15th to March 31st is what's considered manatee season. Again, that's the time of year when manatees are more likely to be in Florida waters. So the population numbers in our Florida waters is higher that time of the year. And so it's time to be more aware of them to help protect them. All right. 
All right, since the title of our session today is all about manatees, let's dive right in to learn more about these amazing animals, which of course are, is the namesake of our center. So to start off, what is a manatee? And you're welcome to respond in the chat. And I'm sure our, our moderators will see that today, but you know, do you know what a manatee is? What type of animal is a manatee? And for sake of time, I'm probably not gonna spend too much time, but those are the types of questions we'd ask our students too in our programming. So manatees like us are human, or like humans are mammals. So animals that are mammal, mammals share some common traits. And these include things like we have backbones, we have hair or fur on our bodies, we give birth to live young, we nurse our young, and uh, we also breathe air. So as aquatic mammals or marine mammals, manatees live in warm tropical and subtropical waters. And Florida manatees actually spend time in both fresh and saltwater environments. So a manatee has a long gray body, it has a rounded flat tail, so kind of like uh, it swims like a whale or a dolphin with a movement up and down, unlike sharks that move side to side. And also they have two flippers. And if you look closely at this picture, you'll note that they have fingernails, kind of like our fingernails. And if you were to look inside at the skeleton of manatees, their flippers, they have digits. They have the structure of the fingers like us in terms of their bone structure. They also have what are called prehensile lips. So their lips are able to grasp. So they use that to grasp their food and guide it into their mouths. And the other interesting thing is that those lips can move interdependently. So they're really able to have quite the flexibility to grasp onto things. Uh, sometimes they're even seen grasping onto things like uh, crab trap lines um, with their lips as well. So manatees, as you can see in this picture, are eating grasses. They are herbivores, meaning that they only eat vegetation or plants. And they typically will feed along the bottom, but occasionally they'll feed along the side of the shoreline as well, as you can see in this picture. So their appearance and diet likely contribute to their nickname of sea cow. <laughs> So they certainly don't look like this uh, in terms of the coloration, but they are often referred to as sea cows because of that grazing um, behavior and the type of food that they eat. So they can eat up to 10% of their body weight per day, typically vegetation like seagrasses or other aquatic plants. So if, if they look like this or don't look like this, I should say, are they related to cows? Well, who are manatees relatives? So a Florida manatee is a subspecies uh, of a West Indian manatee. So the West Indian manatee is split into two groupings, Florida manatee and the Antillean manatee. In Florida, the Florida manatees are found in coastal waters, estuaries and bays, as well as within freshwater springs or rivers or canals. And within that aspect, we're looking at the Everglades, within their habitat around the Everglades, it's mostly in the coastal areas around the Everglades, including parts of Florida Bay, the 10,000 Islands, and the Florida Keys, uh, as well as obviously areas like in our Lake Worth Lagoon that are a part of that greater uh, Everglades ecosystem and also on the West Coast as well. So the Florida manatee belongs to the order Serenia. So as I mentioned, also in the Serenian uh, order, there's also the Antillean manatees. Their range is typically around parts of um, the Gulf, uh, of Florida, or sorry, the Gulf of Mexico, but towards the Central America and South American uh, down in those areas in the Antilles, so not in Florida. And then there's other species, including the Amazonian manatee. This particular one is found in the freshwater systems of the Amazon. It's actually a purely freshwater species. It's also the smallest of the manatee species. And then there's the West African manatee, although not as much is known about this particular species. It is known that it is similar to our Florida manatee in terms of going back and forth from fresh and salt water. And also it um, tends to be a little bit more nocturnal in terms of its behavior. So it's more active at night. We also have the dugong, which is found in the Indo-Pacific area. So also parts of Australia uh, coastline where this particular species is found. And can anybody see a difference that they see between the dugong and the other manatee species? You might be able to see it in the picture there. 
but it has a forked tail, much similar to um, a dolphin tail. So the dugong is able to swim a little bit faster, probably because of this tail shape and, and you know, its, its overall body makeup than our Florida manatee. It also dives a little deeper. Uh, and one of the other interesting things is that its face tends to be more facing down. If you see pictures of manatees, and we'll have a few of them in this presentation, the manatee, uh, Florida manatee face can look outwards. And you saw as it was feeding on the shoreline, it can probably tilt its head up a little bit. Can't go side to side. It's actually missing one of, well, not missing, but it has six vertebrae instead of seven. Doesn't have the ability to turn side to side. Can only go up and down. Um, but it can kind of reach up and, and get its food, whereas the dugong does not have the ability to do that. So another Cyrenian was a stellar sea cow. And this particular animal, unfortunately, is no longer with us. It was hunted to extinction within 27 years of its discovery by Europeans. So this particular animal was found in the Bering Sea between Russia and Alaska. Uh, but again, it was hunted uh, most likely because it also had a fair amount of blubber. Obviously, it was surviving in those cold uh, temperatures. It had to have some warmth and, warmth and insulation. All the other um, relatives here don't have that, manatees included. Even though they're very large, they're not actually very fat. <laughs> they don't have a lot of fat. So they don't have a lot of insulation, which is partly why they need to come to Florida or to come to Florida in winter to seek warm water. And that critical temperature for manatees is about 68 degrees. They need water temperatures above that for their survival. So who do you think are some of the closest modern relatives that are land relatives or land dwelling relatives of manatees? So there's a couple similarities, but also they look very different. So the elephant is one as well as the hyrax. So obviously these two mammals look totally different from manatees and from each other, but there are some similar characteristics either um, shared by all of them or between some of them. So on the left-hand side here, you'll see the lower jaw of a manatee. So each of these animals has some unique dentition or teeth. They each have molars, which is what you see here. They look like our back teeth, our molars. And the interesting, uh, trait shared between manatees and elephants is they have the unique ability to replace their teeth throughout their lives. So new teeth come in in the back and they push forward kind of like a little conveyor belt and the old teeth fall out at the front. This is called marching molars. It's very useful for manatees because they're feeding at the bottom of the, in the water where a lot of sand is. So oftentimes when they're grasping at that seagrass, they're pulling sand into their mouths and that sand can wear down their teeth. So the ability to have new teeth coming in, certainly helpful throughout their lives. The middle picture here, again, shows those prehensile lips. Does it look like anything you might've seen on an elephant? So probably you've seen the end of an elephant's trunk and their ability to pick up things. So that's that grasping ability of those prehensile parts of their body. And that's a similar uh, characteristic between them. The other characteristic is those fingernails. Although not present on the Amazonian manatee, on the other manatee and dugong species, there are the fingernails, as well as on the hooves of elephants and also the hoof-like feet of hyrax, they have fingernails as well. So another piece of trivia here, our next one. And that question is gonna be what species is not closely related to the manatee? Any your results, everybody's getting their answers in. It's a little bit of a mix of results. All right, we're upwards of about three quarters of respondents, we're getting close. Give another few seconds here for everybody to get their answers in. All right, so there's your results. Looks like majority of you got that it was the walrus that is not a really related uh, animal to our manatees. Even though they look very similar in body shape, they're actually not that closely related. Do not know how to sip them. Excuse me. All right, but we do have that the 
elephants, again, are a close land dwelling relative. And the dugongs and the extinct stellar sea cow are within the order of Serenia with Florida manatees. <clears throat> there we go. All right, so a few other facts about manatees. So the average adult manatee can weigh about a thousand pounds and is about 10 feet in length. They can get upwards of about 13 feet and as much as about 3,500 pounds, so quite sizable. So baby manatees, also known as calves, weigh about 50 to 70 pounds when they're born and are about four feet in length. So you can see some kind of comparisons to an adult person or a child here on this image. As mentioned, they're vegetarian. So to get this big, they're eating quite a bit of food. So they're eating or grazing about eight hours a day. They're spending a lot of time. As mentioned, they can eat about 10% of their body weight. So if your average manatee is a thousand pounds, that's 100 pounds of vegetation each day, which equates to about 400 quarter pounder cheeseburgers for us. Can you imagine <laughs> trying to eat that much? Even for, say, the average weight of a, of a third grader, they would be eating maybe about 26 quarter pounder cheeseburgers a day to be the equivalent. That's amazing. So they're definitely uh, very hungry and, and active eaters. So manatees can live for quite some time if they're in captivity. So they can live upwards uh, of 65 to 70 years. The oldest manatee was Snooty, uh, which was in captivity. Unfortunately, Snooty died due to an accident. So we don't know exactly how long they truly can live. In the wild, their lifespan is likely much less, uh, typically probably about 20, maybe 30 years. And that's due to the fact that they have a lot of other challenges in their marine environment that they have to deal with. So even though they're not known to really have any predators, natural predators, uh, it's still a challenging life for manatees. And there's a lot out there that they have to uh, deal with in their lives. So manatees are listed as a threatened species. They're protected by federal and state laws. And the population, because it still faces so many threats, the protections remain in place, even though it was reclassified from endangered uh, just a few years ago. So the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission on their website, they currently have information regarding the population, which they assess through a variety of ways, um, has indicating that it had grown to a minimum of about 7,500 animals. Uh, that was probably from a couple years ago. So this is something that obviously they continue to monitor, monitor and look at issues that face this uh, species, including some of the current situations that it's facing related to some of the seagrass loss and habitat loss. So what are those threats, threats to manatees? So there's a variety of human related threats as well as some natural uh, threats. So watercraft has led the category in terms of the um, sig most significant cause of death for human related causes of death for manatees for many years. And this is due to watercraft impacts, um, also the propeller, so acute injuries. Um, so watercraft can be very dangerous for manatees. So it's important if you're out on the water to know how to be aware of what habitat manatees may be in and how to take precautions to make sure that we're helping protect them. Uh, there's also speed zones that go into effect during manatee season to try to minimize boat uh, activity because slowing down will likely allow animals to move out of the way and also create less impact if there is an interaction. Flood control structures can also be problematic. So manatees can get stuck when those flood control structures close. Uh, luckily, a lot of those have been fitted with sensors to detect if there's something there and they will not close, they will reopen and allow that animal to move along. Fishing gear and entanglements. So things like discarded fishing gear, nets, um, sometimes crab trap, line, crab trap lines, as I mentioned, Manatees can be curious and they will interact with these items and unfortunately can get entangled. And those entanglements can lead to things like um, amputations of, of flippers and that prevents them from being able to move around too well or may even lead to death. So definitely important reason for us all to take responsibility of what goes into the marine environment. Be careful to not have those items discarded and improperly. So loss of habitat, as we mentioned earlier, and some, some of the, the challenges of manatees and the seagrass losses, 
uh, you know, over time, even right around the center that we work at at Manatee Lagoon, the Lake Worth Lagoon has changed so much over the years. And during parts of, of our history over the last about 100 years or so, there's been a lot of development in the area, a lot of armoring of the shoreline. So seawalls have been built and that has resulted in some loss of habitat, whether mangrove shorelines, seagrasses. And so over time, those impacts not only impact manatees, but many species within the, that ecosystem. Luckily, over the last you know, 20 years or so, a lot of organizations, including in our area, Palm Beach County, uh, and many partners have worked together to restore marine habitat or estuarine habitat in Lake Worth Lagoon and many other places. So trying to improve those conditions to provide habitat for wildlife. Pollution, as we all know, it's a problem for everything in our environment, for ourselves, as well as the living animals that depend on clean water to survive. So that definitely is a challenge to the species. Poaching or hunting, luckily for the Florida manatee, has pretty much been removed because of all the protections that have been placed and the education that has taken place. But historically, they were hunted. And many other manatee uh, species or dugongs uh, are still hunted at, in some locations. And obviously the results for the stellar sea cow were that it was hunted to extinction. Harassment is an, a, a significant threat. Um, many people might not realize that just by interacting or being around manatee can disrupt its behavior. And in some cases it may make a manatee move from a warm water location. And remember it needs that warm water to survive. And also sometimes harassment can separate a mother and a calf and calves are dependent on their moms for up to two years of their lives. So if they're separated, then their, their life is at risk. Some of the natural threats include cold weather. As we mentioned, manatees cannot sustain themselves in water temperatures below 68 degrees for very long. They will start to experience something called cold stress. And that's an illness that they uh, experience and it can cause some lesions on their bodies some white sp uh, splotches um, as well as other things that contribute actually to their death as well and red tide is a naturally occurring uh, microorganism uh, it forms algal blooms and it also produces a toxin and that toxin is a neurotoxin and it's known to cause issues especially on the west coast of florida where if it comes into the areas where manatees are known to gather manatees kind of get a double whammy because they're eating the seagrasses at the bottom, which are part of the water column where the algae can be, as well as breathing right at the surface. And the organism can sometimes get what we call aerosol, uh, aerosolized, which means it gets into the air as tiny little particles and the manatees are breathing that into their lungs. So red tide can cause manatee deaths as well. So those are some of the, the challenges and, and issues that manatees face for their survival. But on a brighter note, how do manatees spend their time? So other than feeding, which we know that they have to spend quite a bit of time, those eight hours maybe about for feeding. So in general, they may be swimming around, migrating or just moving to find food or warm water. They will spend a lot of time resting between two and 12 hours, just suspended in the water column, sometimes right at the surface or right at the bottom. And the bottom is where their favorite food, the seagrasses. So typically they're also found in pretty shallow waters, three to six feet typically, because that's also where their seagrasses are growing. So manatees are present in Florida waters throughout the year, but their numbers may be lower. As I mentioned, they may travel outside of the state. So they may go to some of the neighboring states to the north as well as to the west, and they may um, travel quite far. Uh, but then when it starts to get cold, they're going to start moving back to Florida. So this is a perfect lead into a brief little virtual field trip to our center. So we've gotten a little taste of some of the manatee information that we cover in some of our programs, but now I'm gonna share you a couple more examples of some of the uh, features that we may include in some of our other programs. So we often talk about some of the things that I've been sharing already about how manatees will start to migrate and move as temperatures drop. So typically at the start of manatee seasons, manatees are coming from the north, maybe typically as far as the Carolinas, but occasionally manatees will travel as far as Cape Cod, Massachusetts. They'll also spread out to the west, again, eh, pretty much just a couple states, but they might be as far over as Louisiana or the Texas coast. And so they'll be migrating back to Florida. And locally, 
when we start to experience chilly conditions, at least from our perspective, they may move into the area by Manatee Lagoon. And manatees may be throughout the intercoastal area, or they may be following along the outside of the coastline there um, along the Atlantic on this coast. So they come to the area, as I mentioned, called the outflow, where the clean warm water is released from the adjacent power plant. And when that water is released, it can be released uh, up to about 14 degrees warmer than the surrounding lagoon waters. And when we're open, our manatee masters conduct daily aquatic life surveys, or we call them our manatee counts. And this helps us know how many manatees or what other things we see in the water um, that day. And we can share that with our visitors. So during some of our programs, we invite the students to perform these ob observations with us. And we do that um, so that they can see what's in the water. So obviously, and during a cool time in, in our winter conditions, this might be something that we would see, a lot of manatees. But even if it's not cold, we might see quite a bit. So we check out all the different things that we can see and the conditions of the environment that we're observing in. So to do so, we at first explain on the left side is an aerial view of our center and the surrounding waters. And we show how we split the area up into four zones. They're labeled A, B, C, and D. And we typically focus on A. On the right here is a fact sheet or a, a worksheet that we use with our fifth grade marine science series program. And we use that to have the students make observations. We provide some of the information, but they're also making their own observations. And some of that observation is done on our, um, using some video footage, if we're not able to see live. So I'm just gonna do a quick screen stop of that for a second. So we also use imagery like this and we'll have the students try to count the manatees. It can be very challenging. Sometimes the water isn't as clear as this, uh, but we'll use some of this to get an idea of how the animals are using the site. So you can see many manatees on this particular day. So likely it was a nice, cold, uh, clear day. And then we'll continue on. So some of the other clips that we'll use may show manatees with their calves or scarred manatees. There's another manatee with their calf as well as just general manatee behavior, such as breathing. You might see some other little movement in the water in some of these clips that are some of the other marine life that we see at the center. You may even spot at the top of this screen a tag. So that's a manatee that was tagged. So when we make these observations, we're looking out into the water here, and then we review what we see once the students have had a chance to make their own observations. So here we see a manatee that is scarred, and we also see lots of fish. And if we look closely, in some cases, we can identify some of the fish. There's some black and white striped fish. And so we'll review those different species that we see. So we may see things like the spotted eagle ray. We may see shark species. There's the black and white fish up there is the um, sheep's head. We also see green sea turtles, as well as barracuda, tarpon, many other animals. We also incorporate into some of our activities how our center will work on documenting scarred manatees. So there is a database that the United States Geological Survey oversees that has information about manatees that have been identified through photographs and sketching of scars. And they're given unique names or identifiers. And then over time, if they're seen again and documented, we can learn more about their lives. So at our center, our team of manatee masters who are educators also do take photos and do these sketches to try to contribute to that database. And so scientists are able to identify those animals from their scar patterns, and then again, re-identify uh, them later on in their lives. So that really helps us start to tell the history and the life of those animals and better understand them so we can protect them better. So outside of our educational and venue functions at the center, um, we also participate in additional activities with direct conservation impact. And one of those is our underwater cleanup. So we do this next to the center each year before manatee season and clean it up before our manatees start gathering back at the center. And we can use the information from these reports in our educational programs. So here we can see that in our top five items removed in this most recent cleanup, unfortunately hard plastics 
um, pieces were the most commonly found items. So that's a good opportunity to reinforce what we all can do to help protect manatees and keep that material out of the water. We also assist in manatee rescues and releases. So we do this with our partners who lead those efforts, such as the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. These particular animal or this particular animal is a cool story that while conducting a manatee count, so the same type of survey we do with the students, uh, in February 2019, our team noticed a manatee that wasn't doing so well. It was a little unusual for this young calf to be alone. Uh, typically, they're with their moms um, for up to two years, as we mentioned. So the manatee was rescued by the FWC, and it was determined that this young male manatee was an orphan who was experiencing cold stress. And you can see in the picture on the right, some of the white spots on the manatee's head are indicators of that cold stress uh, syndrome. And so this um, animal was transported to the Miami Sea Aquarium for rehabilitation to be nursed back to health. And after a few months, it was uh, deemed that it was doing pretty well, um, but it wasn't ready to be released because it wasn't able to you know, be on its own. So it was actually sent up to Columbus, Ohio, to the Columbus Zoo, who, where there is a facility to keep manatees um, while they're getting ready to be released. And then approximately two years later, it was sent back to Florida and released locally right back into the waters next to our center. So it was a very exciting day to see an animal that had been rescued with our team's help and then also returning back to the wild. And you can see this animal was um, tagged. So there was a tag attached to it so that the researchers could follow where it went to make sure it was doing well. I know we're getting a little close on time, so I'm gonna keep us moving. Oops, or keep playing. <laughs> Got the next trivia. And it's what do scientists use to tell manatees apart? And there's our poll. We'll probably be quick on the poll so we can keep moving. So get your answers in quickly. And it looks like everybody is doing pretty well. Try not to make these trivia questions too hard if you're paying attention. All right, we'll give you just a couple more seconds. Doing pretty good. All right, so it looks like mostly everybody got that it's the scar pattern. A few people thought it was the flipper shape. So it would be really hard to tell between flippers um, of vanities unless the flipper had been damaged or there was an injury to it. And then that would be part of that sketching and that scar pattern observation. So that could contribute to being able to tell the difference. So that's not so bad a guess. Good job. All right, so there we go. So let's move on to the educational resources that are available. So I know that's what a lot of you are interested in. So when we're open, we do offer grade targeted uh, in-person field trips for grades K through 12. Obviously there's gonna be some changes to our programming when we reopen and exactly what's going to happen hasn't quite been decided. So that information will be on our website once we do. Uh, but typically groups would arrive, they would be split into three smaller groups and they rotate through three stations, about 20 to 30, typically 30 minute stations. So about a 90 minute program. And we have K1, um, on option two through five option, six to eight option, and a high school option as well. We also launched our virtual programming, our live programming. We do a marine science series. It's a 10 week, um, 20 to 30 minute lessons each week, uh, virtual program in collaboration with the Reef Institute, which is a nonprofit locally here in Palm Beach County. And we do offer this in fall and spring. And we are happy to announce that this fall, we're going to be releasing a recorded package of these. So there is the potential that a fee will be implemented for the live programming, but the recorded package, which will include the lesson plans, which can be incorporated, they have adaptations for the classroom as well, will be available for free. You just need to sign up and then receive the, the information on where to access all the videos and um, the supporting materials. So other virtual lessons, we have a few uh, elementary and middle school programs that we'll be offering virtually at different times in between some of our other um, programming. Another resource to be familiar with is on our website. So at visitmanatealagoon.com uh, slash manatee hyphen cam is our manatee cam. And that's a live stream video showing that outflow area. So you can look and see if manatees are present. 
you might not be able to see all the other marine life there, but typically you can uh, determine if the weather is getting colder and you feel like it's you know, possibly good conditions. Just keep in mind the first cold weather of the year might not be when manatees are there because it's the water temperature that drives them into finding the warm water resource. Uh, but you'd be able to see if manatees are present. You can do that from anywhere. We also have additional online uh, resources under the heading. You can see there's the manatee cam. It's also available on the side of the screen there too. Um, but there's also the virtual learning tab and the link there at the bottom. And on this tab, we have a variety of short educational videos. They may range from you know, less than a minute up to about five minutes. And they're on a variety of topics, including a lot of our frequently asked questions, including what is a manatee? Uh, what do manatees eat? How big do manatees get? Uh, why do they come to Manatee Lagoon? And each of these is typically paired with a resource uh, like that's printable. Uh, this one happens to be with a pledge sheet taking a pledge to how they can protect manatees and Lake Worth Lagoon. There may be um, some drawing activities, so there's art components as well, and also some activity sheets that may have some math or observational aspects. So just a variety of resources, and that's all available on our website and free to download. Uh, also, we just wanted to share as part of Florida Power and Light that the company also has some additional energy curriculum resources for educators, um, open source curriculum for grades four through six on energy. So that might be of interest to you or other fellow colleagues. All right, then just a quick review of how we can all help manatees. So it's important, you know, our goal is to educate the community about manatees in the surrounding South Florida ecosystem. And our hope is that we encourage all of you to really do your part to help the environment. And there's some easy ways that we can do that. One is if you're out in the water or you're around areas where manatees may be, it's important to be familiar with what to look for in terms of a distressed animal, if there's an injury or if it's floating weird in the water, it doesn't quite able to go and submerge. Um, if you see gashes, keep in mind scars are typically healed. They may look gray or, or less white. But if you see something that looks pretty deep and, and fresh, certainly want to be able to report that to the FWC. That's the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and their alert hotline is there. It also goes for animals that might look like they are experiencing cold stress. Or if you see a very small uh, animal, um, you know, several, four feet long, five feet long, that's not with a mom, you don't see the mom coming back. They do sometimes separate for a little bit, um, but it's good to report that as well. Also, when you're out boating, make sure you know and are familiar with the boating laws and the boating signs and obey those. Slow down, especially in habitat where manatees would be found, and wear polarized sunglasses that can help you see in the water. Always properly dispose of your trash and plastics. Make sure those don't end up in our, in our environment. They should go in the proper place. And then learn more and share that information with others. And that's what we really hope everybody will do and, and appreciate these amazing animals. So last trivia question, why do manatees migrate south in the winter? So, hopefully that's been the emphasis of some of this presentation and it looks like you guys are all doing really well with that answer, a lot of quick answers. There's a few that might think a little differently, and then that may be a, a definitely a reason for moving around. So it looks like we've got just about everybody responding on this. So yes, to, to they do uh, travel or migrate, which is that movement seasonally to find warm water to survive. Certainly, they move around, and they do need to find food as well. All right. So thank you for attending, and I'm happy to take questions. You know we're uh, Still have a few minutes here, so. Wonderful. So we had a question in the chat. Um, do you have a trunk program where you can send uh, artifacts or maybe come to schools, any sort of traveling program? We unfortunately right now do not have a program where we can go out to um, schools. We, we do participate in some outreach events or festivals where we do bring some specimens like the bones. But right now our options are virtual, um, you know, electronically virtual, so to speak, and also in person. Um, 
I will share that there are some other organizations that may have some of those resources. I believe the FWC may have uh, some materials that, that could be sent or shared. So you might want to check out their website and see if that would meet your needs if a virtual program isn't an option for you. Fantastic. Thank you. And just like all of our other presentations, all of the resources that Wendy discussed will be on our website under the All About Manatees uh, Symposium tab. So you will get a chance to learn and uh, stay connected that way. Uh, so again, um, visit us at evergladesliteracy.org to stay connected and learn more. This session will, is recorded and will be on the website under the Teacher Symposium tab, and you will also receive a follow-up email about professional development points, certificate of completion, as well as those links that we talked about today throughout the session. So we love the virtual component because we know that we have schools that are not in Palm Beach County. And so by having that virtual manatee cam, by having the virtual resources and videos that's fantastic and we know that manatees don't just live in palm beach county that they're all over the state um, and central florida and the rivers and uh, springs all the way over to naples uh, so we know that uh, we see we see them all over the state so that's fantastic definitely we get a little centric uh, focal on the the palm beach county side of things but definitely great points to make um, there's even other locations where you can view manatees within the state of Florida, too, and you can learn more about that. Uh, the FWC site has a great resource and map showing you those locations. Wonderful. Thank you. So we do have a very special giveaway for this session. Uh, it is a manatee swag bag provided by Manatee Lagoon. So thank you, Wendy. And the winner is... Can drum roll. <laughs> you can click the next slide. Perfect. So it's it, <laughs> no, you're good. It is Mercy Garcia from Mater Prep Academy in Miami Dade County. So awesome. uh, thank you, Mercy. We are so excited to um, have you here today. We are so excited to have everyone a part of our session. Mercy will reach out to you in a little bit to. Um, tell you how you won your prize, which is that really awesome and exciting manatee swag bag. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, this is the last session of the day. Um, however, we do have day two tomorrow, Thursday, July 22nd. Uh, join us bright and early at 9 a.m. for session five. This is Join the Conversation, Diversity and Inclusion in Environmental Education with a fantastic panel, a wide variety of um, panelists who are excited to uh, combat some issues in environmental education. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Wendy, uh, for um, your presentation all about manatees. We had some fantastic comments. Uh, grandsons learned a lot, very informative, didn't know manatees made it all the way up to the Northeast. Look forward to share these resources. Uh, love manatees, grew up near Palm Springs. We love that connection, absolutely. So again, thank you all for being here today. Be sure to continue to share your excitement. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as use the hashtags Everglades Literacy, get your feet wet, and take the next step. Uh, so thank you all and have a great rest of your day. We'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you.